Welcome to Getting Started with Community Preservation Projects, Laying the Foundation for Success. My name is Nicole Flynn. I am the Field Services Representative at the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. I work with community projects and support preservation easements and the grants programs at the Alliance. It is great to have you as a participant in our virtual gatherings presented by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, the statewide membership-based historic preservation organization this gathering is part of our ongoing and expanding work to help provide information to people like you who are caring for old homes, barns, and community landmarks. We hope that you'll become a member if you're not already. Memberships help us save more community projects like the ones you're working on, advocate for preservation around the state and at the local level, and expand the preservation toolbox so that we can encourage more preservation investment. We provide a lot of uh, assistance in new and old ways, and even a little support from you can help make a big difference. Today's panelists have work on, worked on some great preservation projects in our state. They have made great progress in their projects and are here to share some of their wisdom on getting started with community preservation projects like theirs. We are recording this session and we'll be posting it to our webinars page and our YouTube page for future reference. By continuing to participate in this session, you agree to be recorded. This session will be a discussion of the topics listed in the event description, but we also encourage our participants to pose questions and to share their ideas. To start the session, I would ask you to mute your microphones and use the chat feature to pose any questions or share comments. We will open it up at the end for those questions not covered by our panelists and also to get some insight from you on your projects. It's wonderful to have Rebecca Mitchell, a member of our board and longtime leader in Stratham, um, who has worked on several important community preservation projects in her time with the Heritage Commission. From the Preservation Alliance staff, we have Maggie Steer, a wonderful resource for preservation in New Hampshire and our advanced projects coordinator. And from Laura Gilmanton, we have the dynamic pair of Paula Gilman and Sula Clerk, whose love for their hometown led them to champion for their beloved historic resources. Our goal with this session is to try to answer some of your questions, provide you with some practical advice and inspire you with successes of preservation projects in our state. So at this time, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started with our discussion. So uh, the Preservation Alliance has created a wonderful set of resources and a lot of them can be accessed through our website. Um, in here, you can find out about us, about our upcoming events, as well as have access to our webinars. But what I want to show you today is in our resources section, we have a section here on community landmarks and grants. Um, and just below there, you can see the link for our webinars for our past virtual gatherings that we've done. In this page, you will find an overview about pretty much what we're gonna be talking about in the first three sessions, this session, a session in January and a session in February about really getting you the practical steps that you need to do to build a strong foundation for your community preservation project. And I'll send out these links and also I will send out a copy of this document here that's hyperlinked right in the overview section, getting started with your old building. This breaks down really the roadmap for getting started with preservation projects. It gives you a lot of the resources that are available in New Hampshire, as well as the other organizations that you should be familiar with. Um, there's also practical information on the right-hand side of this, including a guide on how to preserve a building, financial resources, preservation easements, if you're interested in those upcoming workshops and training. And lastly, our directory. And in the directory, you can find information about preservation consultants, uh, contractors, and architects and engineers, as well as um, uh, specialists, people who work on roofs, people who work on historic windows. All right. Um, Another organization that you should be familiar with with preservation uh, community landmark projects is LCHIP, the Land 
Community Heritage Investment Program, and they give a large portion of uh, money to um, historic preservation projects across the state. Um, historic resources uh, are eligible for matching grants for a variety of projects. And it's a great resource to go to their website and look and see if um, there are other projects that are like yours, because you may find that recent projects are very similar to what you're getting started with. And those people may be great resources for pitfalls or things to avoid or contractors um, that may be wonderful resources for your projects. Next, if your property is municipally owned, um, you uh, may be eligible for a Moose Plate grant. These grants are up to $10,000 and they do not require a match. And this is an annual program. Amy Dixon at New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources manages this program. And it's another great resource for municipal projects, um, historic buildings owned by municipalities. And I mentioned the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources. They are the state organization um, for preservation in the state of New Hampshire. And they um, administer different programs as well as section 106 review. They handle information about archeological resources throughout the state and also have a lot of information um, and expertise that you can reach out to uh, if we are not able to answer the question, but they are the keeper of the state register and um, many sources of historic preservation funding do require a determination of eligibility from the uh, State Historic Preservation Office, which is the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources. All right. Um, you can find out information about their programs on their website, uh, including the National Register of Historic Places, the state register of historic places, as well as any um, project archeology span or any other uh, information that the state may have about your resource would be in their Emmet uh, system. And that's the enhanced mapping and management tool, information tool. That's where the determination of eligibility is kept as well as state register nominations and national register nominations. All right. Um, so to give you a broad picture of what um, the Preservation Alliance does is we fill in that private portion of this uh, chart that you're seeing here. In New Hampshire, we are a nonprofit that is here to support you with technical and ad, um, uh, expert advice on contractors, on techniques, on resources and on funding opportunities. Um, so we fill that support role, whereas the public sector handles the regulatory as well as uh, keeping historical information about your building. So the state register is a great resource because people have nominated buildings for the state register as well as the national register. And that is a repository of the history of the built environment in New Hampshire. I will be sending out a copy of this. Um, there are links in here if you would like to um, see what kind of resources are available, both at our website, the Division of Historical Resources website, as well as the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which is the nonprofit na nationwide organization working in preservation, and the National Park Service, uh, which is the public sector organization working in preservation. And that is part of the Secretary of the Interior. And they have wonderful resources, including the Secretary of the Interior standards for the care and treatment of historic structures on their website, as well as practical guides for different types of recommended treatments for historic resources. Anything that I have said so far, <laughs> if you don't understand or you have more questions for, please feel free to email me. I'll be including, um, well, of course, my email in the email that I give you at the uh, conclusion of this um, event. But um, 
most of the work that I do is helping point people to the resources and information that they need to support their project. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or call the Preservation Alliance. Um, the last section of the public sector that I wanna talk about that you may run into working in your project are the local level uh, organizations that make decisions on historic resources. And those uh, fall into two categories, heritage commissions and historic district commissions. You want to know that if your project is in a historic district or in a town that has a heritage commission, you may have to uh, go to them for um, approval of permits or the project. And also a great resource in your towns would be your historic societies if you need information about owners or historic use of the building or possibly even any photographs or uh, other documentation that may be available about your building may be available through the historical society. At this time, I'd like to introduce Maggie Steer, who is my colleague. Uh, Advanced Programs Director at the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, and hopefully she can fill in any gaps for things that I have missed. Gosh, um, thank you. <laughs> it all seems like an alphabet soup when you're beginning. And I think the best advice that I could give to someone is sit down with Nicole and describe your project, what you hope to do, what the building is, and set out the first couple of steps, not more than the first couple. And generally that would be getting your building determined eligible for the state register because that's the first step in determining your eligibility for certain grants such as Moose Play or LCHIP funding. And then I know she's gonna talk about this later, but you really need to know a little bit more about your building. And again, searching through Emmett or talking to um, the staff in the Division of Historical Resources will tell you a little bit more about your building as well as doing some local research. We have a great webinar that's archived on our website called How to Research Your Historic Building. It's mostly related to homes, but not exclusively. So I would encourage people to look at that too. But um, just to summarize, when you're getting started, you have passion, you really want to save a building, you love the place where, um, you know, the place that you're trying to save, but it can be daunting to um, figure out how to do what you want to do. And that's why the Preservation Alliance is here to give you that personalized service and, and even hand holding if you need it to get started. Thank you, Maggie. Um, so we have some two very uh, skilled and uh, successful preservation uh, project leaders here in our midst. Paula and Sue in Lower Gilmanton are successfully handling not one, but two preservation projects. Um, so I can pull up a picture of the first one that they sent. Um, and I would like to turn it over to Paula and Sue to talk about your projects and how you got started. Okay, hi, my name is Sue. Um, I, I agree with you, you have to have a passion. You have to love the particular building that you want to um, take care of. It, it, it needs, yeah, it needs to speak to you. Um, this particular building has been in Lower Gilmington since 1840. 1842 and um, one of my relatives was one of the signers of the constitution for this particular church. So in other words, my family's been in Gilmington since 1802. Um, so I have a strong passion for this particular building. Um, one of the things that really got us going on this, we had, we have about 13 or 14 members that try to take care of this particular building um, on a work bee once a summer. Needless to say, one day in the summer is not going to do a whole lot. Um, we got to the point in, um, I believe it's 2018. Yeah. 
uh, when, I'm also the cleaning lady there for church services. <laughs> <laughs> so when I went in after a rainy day, I was seeing water inside of the church in the pews. Um, it had just been painted inside and it's and water's coming down through on the tin cladding. So it was it was horrendous. So we were able to contact a local um, his a local person that does a lot of restoration work, um, Steve Bedard, and he came and said, "Okay, you've got to do something because you're going to lose the structure." Um, so um, we contacted you, <laughs> uh, New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, and we had. Um, an assessment done, um, looking at what needed to get done. And these, you are fabulous. I mean, you came through in during, after a snow, um, jumping over snow banks to come look at our building and talk to us and um, suggest what kind of an assessment we needed to have. Um, so that's where we started. Um, and then through that, we were able to contact um, individuals, again, thank to you, who would do this kind of work. Um, so, Paula, why don't you jump in from, from here? Okay, well, not too much I can add. Um, just a, a tiny bit of background. Sue's family's been here since 1802. Um, I'm a Gilman. Uh, the town was named after my relatives. And my seventh great grandfather, Antipas Gilman, along with another gentleman, John Meserve, deeded to the church the land that it now stands on. It replaces the original church of 1773 that deteriorated. Um, so that's just a little background on how deep our roots go. And as Sue was saying, you have to have a catalyst. Well, we had the catalyst. It was the leaking roof. And we had um, Steve Bedard referred us to Steve Fifield, who came in. And we sort of stumbled as we went along, but we persevered. Um, we got the, we had the, Steve Bedard did our historic building assessment. Then we moved on and we had to find out, um, gee, you, uh, is your church a 501c3? No. You need to have a sponsor. So fortunately for us, the Historical Society, Gilmanton Historical Society, offered to be our sponsor, which was fabulous. So keep that in mind. Either you have to be a 501c3 or you have to have a 501c sponsor. We then submitted an application to, um, as, to become a nominee for Seven to Save. They don't award grants, but it gives you recognition throughout the state, which was unbelievable. We were so lucky. We were nominated for that. Um, I don't know how much you want me to chat about this particular one. I have a list of things that I can say, but um, if you noticed that we have this little thermometer here, we actually have two. And the gentleman in the middle is Reverend Al Page. He's in his middle eighties. And he constructed these two thermometers for us, which were phenomenal. Um, people would go by and they'd, they'd do double takes. So every two thousand dollars that we um, would we raise, that every two thousand dollars that we raised, we went and and raised the thermometer. Um, so yeah, there we go. <laughs> sometimes it was weekly, sometimes it was monthly. Um, we just wanted the the townspeople to know. Um, and again, this is all during the beginning of COVID. Um, so we were not able to have a huge fundraiser to, to start. Um, and so we did Facebook, we did newspapers, we, we sent letters out, rack cards. We did whatever we could think of, the two of us, <laughs> to, um, to get the word out. And like Paula said, we had these signs on the north side and the south side just to let people know. And it was amazing. Um, just with what we did, how our townspeople um, came together. It was, it was phenomenal. We had huge sums of money. Um, we had $25. I mean, everything was, it was fabulous. Um, Paula's our secretary. So every time we got a $25 check or a $20,000 check, out went a thank you letter. Um, so we made sure that was taken care of. But again, you have to have a passion. You have to realize that what you were doing is no longer um, 
something that you can do to save this huge building. Everybody has tried over the years, but it was more than um, what our little work bee could do. We did not want to see this building um, fall. So yeah, so we, we had fun and that's the leveling of the, <laughs> the foundation. Um, that was pretty interesting to watch. That was done as you look in the far back corner, they were hand jacks. Steve Fifield and his niece Kate would hand jack the building up it and it was it was crazy they had uh, crowbars trying to find the ledge because this building sits on ledge and they finally got um, down to the ledge and then just started jacking it carefully um, little by little they had to take the uh, tin cladding um, uh, top off the wall off the walls inside because they were afraid that they were going to buckle um, this is this is inside when they were looking and seeing what was going on with um, the roof and pieces that may have been missing. <laughs> this this is a picture of the tie beams, <clears throat> and Steve didn't go in there. He was too big, but he sent his niece Kate in there to take that photograph, and he found out that the tie beams, some of them were off as much as two inches, and the tie beams go from side to side. To, um, he had to put in a two foot bolt in one of them in order to secure the tie beams. Um, in, the, in the very first picture that you showed of the church, if you look at it, you will be able to see that the belfry was actually leaning towards the center of the church. Um, and Steve discovered, see it's just kind of a little tilting towards the right. <laughs> And Steve discovered that there had never been a major support beam put in the belfry. So that was installed. Just tell us when to shut up because we can just keep going. <laughs> that's when, that's a picture of the belfry finished. The belfry is finished, been restored. Um, the, um, oh, what, what do you, we'd call the, uh, um, the shutters at the top, we were surprised how huge those were when they came down and had to be replaced and repaired. Um, they're about five feet by three feet. Um, yeah, the clairboards were replaced. They put tin around the outside for um, instead of shingles or instead of rubber, it's, it's, it's copper. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. The, the belfry now is, is fabulous. Um, now we look at the rest of the building and say, okay, we need a paint job. <laughs> the belfry looks really nice. Um, we had to upgrade the um, ADA ramp. Um, my son ha happened to have put on the new porch um, when he was, that was his Eagle Scout project, but the ramp no longer was up to code. So we had to extend the ramp and that's, um, that's our new ADA ramp, which is pretty impressive. Um, we're, we're pleased with that. Now we can enter, now our families can enter um, with ease. So that's our, that's one of our latest pieces. Oh, there's the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse. Um, my name, my maiden name is Kelly. So <laughs> here's another piece of um, my family's history. Um, it's a local schoolhouse. At one point, there were 18 um, one-room schoolhouses in Gilmanton. This is, believe it or not, the last remaining one-room schoolhouse still owned by the school district. Um, in 1778, it was designated as school number one. Um, and when we talk about catalyst, sorry, I didn't mean no, to keep jump in. Jump in, this is what we do, we talk to each other. <laughs> well, when you, when we were saying you need a catalyst, well, this particular schoolhouse, the catalyst was, there was a, a young couple who had recently moved into town from Naples, Florida, and they spotted the school house and uh, they wanted to buy it and move it to their place on the other side of town because they claimed it was closer to the elementary school. Well, I was on, I am on the Gilmanton Historical Society and the um, superintendent sent it to our president who sent an email out to all of us. <laughs> Everybody says I have to say this because my response was all in caps, no way in hell over my dead body is this gonna be sold and moved. So that was our catalyst. Um, and I'm glad we had this, this was our first project. It was a, uh, a great learning curve 
it was much smaller than the First Baptist Church. So we learned what to do and what not to do, which helped us with the First Baptist Church. Uh, we obtained, we've had two Moose Plate grants for this schoolhouse and an LCHIP grant. And we've had a couple of local uh, businesses donate to this as well. These are all the before pictures. The front door had to be revamped. This is after. This is what it looks like on the inside <laughs> now. But this is owned by the school district. And unfortunately, as many of you know, superintendents and business administrators um, tend to move from district to district. And our school board um, did not really know in the beginning that they owned this structure. So we had to make sure to let them know that they did own the structure and our Lower Gilmington Community Club has been renting or leasing this particular building for their um, club meetings for many, many years. So it was a labor of love for the Lower Gilmington Community Club, which Paula and I are members of. And like I said, this is the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse because it's well, probably less than an eighth of a mile from my family's um, home. So. Yeah, and at one point, my father and his five sisters and brothers, total of six kids, were going to school there, okay, um, first grade through eighth grade. Uh, my, old, my oldest uncle was in eighth grade. My youngest aunt was in first grade, and all the Kelly kids were in the school at the same time, and believe it or not, the teacher boarded at the Kelly homestead. So it's been one of those family pieces for years and years and years. Um, that we've enjoyed and the Lower Gilmanton Club has enjoyed using for different gatherings. Um, so again, we had a catalyst, it was going to be moved and we didn't want it moved and we needed this structure to stay where it was originally. I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, we, we made a list of do's and don'ts and I can either email you the do's and don'ts list, Nicole, or I can go through it very briefly. You tell me. Uh, uh, how about we hold the do's and don'ts until after we hear from Becky Mitchell? Okay. And I will definitely send it out as part of our email follow-up. Okay. Um, so to go from uh, two people who are just uh, really involved um, family history, uh, members of the community and stuff. We now have Becky Mitchell, who was more on the administrative side, would you say, Becky? Oh, I, I kind of done about everything. <laughs> Gravel, <laughs> but um, it's interesting to hear the, the Gilmanton case because Stratum, although we have families in Stratum that date back to the late 17th century, 1600s, the majority of the people in our town are newcomers and they know absolutely nothing about town history. Right. So it really is incumbent upon us to bring those people along. And uh, I wanna emphasize just briefly the importance of, yes, you need to do the assessment. Yes, you need all those nuts and bolts, but along the way to start collecting stories because when you're asking people to fork over money, whether it's individual donations or, uh, at a town meeting, um, people are very uh, attracted by stories and they're important to bring people together to support a preservation effort. Um, and now we heard the word catalyst a lot and I'll tell you a little bit about this building and, and the catalyst that almost killed it. Um, this is the Stratum Town Hall that was built in the 1870s and it was built by um, a two local brothers in the second empire style. You can see the, the mansard roof typical of that style and the, the pattern on the slate roof and the decorative arches over the windows. Um, but already this picture was probably taken in the sort of late forties. Um, and you can see already that some changes have occurred and it's, you know, it's seen some, it's seen a lot of use. The building itself, the main body of it is the big meeting hall. Um, initially, the town library was in the small place up in the attic until a, a uh, building was uh, constructed across the street. Um, offices were put in the two front rooms uh, flanking the door. Um, but in the uh, 18, I mean, 1980s, about a little more than 100 years after the town 
built this thing, the town sold it to private purchaser. They decided to move all the town offices to um, at, at the uh, post-World War II public school um, and that was being replaced. And so it fell into private hands. And also, meanwhile, along the way, there'd been a fire that had burnt the stage off of the back of the building. Um, various other changes were, were made. You can see vinyl siding was added. We lost the slate roof. And this is a picture of, of um, before the catalyst hit us. <laughs> Um, and um, it shows some of our volunteers um, working with the Heritage Commission, going around the town center, um, sort of inventorying the historic buildings there. And, you know, in the preservation world, we're often lurching from crisis to crisis, just like you um, in Gilmington, you know, saw the water in the church and needed something to needed to be done. So one of the things we've tried to do in Stratum is get a little bit ahead of things by at least identifying historical structures. So this was, we began to look at the town hall, realize being in tri private hands, having been rented out for a lot of uses over the years, it was a, a, a building that um, faced an uncertain future. And sure enough, um, a few years ago, um, the building went up for sale and uh, a new buyer came forward and immediately um, filed a demolition permit for this in an adjacent building. And so this of course really, um, we, we do have a demolition delay ordinance in Stratum. So we were able to buy some time. And then we went into um, negotiations with the buyer. And this is, um, if you're dealing with, with a building that you don't own yourself, I mean, you. Uh, were involved in projects. Well, you had to negotiate with the school district, but you need to be realistic about what you can, the battles you can win and the battles that aren't worth trying to fight. And you wanna find areas of common interest and understand how the body or entity that might be perceived as threatening the building can be persuaded to um, change course. And in this instance, um, we were able to work with the owner um, and uh, by, by publicizing the risks to this building and its importance to the town history, um, we were able to um, have him realize that his name in town would be mud if he demolished it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> he, he lives in Stratum and, and you know, has a contracting business. So his reputation is important to him. And, but at the same time, we were able to project to him that, that we're, we're not, we were not going to um, be purist about this. We knew we would have to give some leeway um, going on, but that, and that, but also that we could bring experience and expertise to the job, so he would come out with a product that you know, an end result that he would be proud of. So we ended up having to, um, you know, agree to replacement windows, um, things like that. But we were able to do things like. Um, we got uh, we have RSA 79E in our town, which means that he was able to um, when we helped him to apply, and he was successful in postponing his taxes going up for a period of ten years. So um, he put in um, four apartment units in the building, but his taxes will not reflect that um, improvement in the higher value of the building for a period of time in which he's making money from the building. So it, it, it really helped to um, recoup some of the, um, his expenses in, in rehabilitating it. And then we also negotiated an easement with him that the town holds so that we inspect it every year to make sure it's being maintained properly. That, and we have some limitations on what can and cannot um, be done in, the build, done in and to the building. And uh, so that took some, convincing a town meeting vote to appropriate the money for that easement. And it took the purchaser, the fellow on the left there, proudly holding our New Hampshire State Register plaque. Um, but so there was a lot of give and take on either side, but I think we came ahead, um, you know, in the end. And, and he was totally uninterested in preservation, saw no point in it. 
Um, we made certain uh, suggestions to him, including things like he wanted to extend the siding to cover the brick foundation and you know just really things that were pretty bad <laughs> ideas. Um, and uh, he wanted to have, we had to agree to replacement windows, but he, instead of having black, he wanted less expensive white ones. And, you know, so he came around on that. And then now he's, he said, he's so glad that he did this project and that he took our advice on these things. And so everybody's pretty happy about it. I mean, I felt, you know, as I say, you have to know which battles you can uh, win and where you need to, uh, you know, give way a little bit. And uh, since especially being in the Heritage Commission, we're here in part of town uh, government and we don't wanna be perceived as being uh, irrational or contentious, or we wanna be perceived as, as the body that helps to move things along, um, all of while um, protecting historic resources. And this is an example of, of having to give some, but getting something quite important back, which is not losing uh, this, this building in our town center. So there's lots to be said about all these projects, but, and this is a different one because it was, was done by a town um, commission uh, and not a private group of individuals, uh, but the whole town really um, came and got behind it and, uh, I think everybody's pretty pleased with the outcome. Well, and thank I you also so want, much. Oh, I want to say the importance of telling the stories. Um, yes, you need to know all the nuts and bolts about you know what kind of siding you want and all that, but along the way, pull together the stories because that is uh, something that is kind of the glue that holds it all together. Well, thank you, Becky, for your insight and uh, perspective on that. Those are great projects. And um, thank you, Paula and Sue, for your insight on your two project projects. It's um, kind of apropos that uh, these are the projects that are being presented here because they are somewhat similar to some of the new projects that have been brought to my attention over the last three to four months. Um, so I may be calling on you to help uh, mentor these new projects that are getting started. Um, but I'm glad to see a few of them here. Uh, Ellen from Atkinson, and I'm not familiar with the other names that are here. Is that uh, George Kutzelman there? <laughs> also from Atkinson. Um, so at this time, um, I would encourage you guys to turn on your camera if you can, um, if your signal does not uh, work, um, that's fine. Um, I would like to open it up to your questions for our experts here. And Maggie, you're definitely included as an expert with all of your work in Wolfboro and uh, Molson Borough and pretty much everywhere in the state. So if you have a question, uh, speak up. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourselves. I think it would be fun to hear a little bit about everybody's projects and just a little bit about what your building is and, and what you're trying to do and where you are getting stuck. We're, we're just at the beginning stages. Um, and it was brought to our attention that, that there is a plan to tear this down and none of us had been approached we're part of the historical society in town. Uh, Jane Kowalski is another person and Stephen Albert actually went to the one room schoolhouse. Um, it existed from 1880 to 1949. And there were six in the town and this is the last remaining one room schoolhouse. So we're wanting to try to save it. Yay. Who owns it? The town. And it's directly across the street from the elementary school in town. What do so, you see as the obstacles? I'm sorry? What do you see as the obstacles to it's saving lack, it? Lack of interest from the town fathers, I would say. 
is that due to um, they're worried that you might bring the project to the town and it's going to raise taxes? I think they don't think it's important. Do you see um, what kind of allies do you see out there? We're just working on that now as far as um, getting some people that we found um, to give us their stories and we're going to post it on a Facebook account. Um, and we're, we're searching for more. We have a Facebook page in process. Um, yes. Going on right now. Is, I wonder, Stephen, are you on here? Is, yes, I'm on. I just am not on video. Stephen, got Stephen, lives, <laughs> Stephen lives in California, but he's interested in this because he went to the school. Uh -huh. Well, also because I'm interested in the building itself being preserved. I mean, that's yes. really the main thing. Yeah. I grew up in Atkinson, but um, you know, this is a beautiful little school that needs to be preserved for a lot of reasons. And it doesn't seem, as you mentioned, Ellen, that the, the townspeople nor the town political establishment is very interested in seeing this happen. They right. want to, they want to uh, sell the property and tear it down. That's basically yep. where they are. Or tear it down and then sell the property. Well, yes. either way, yes. it doesn't matter. That's right. <laughs> and it's, it's an unbuildable lot. Go figure. Um, is there anyone anyone at all that's interested in this project because <clears throat> one of the things we had to do was to get letters of support <clears throat> right. from all the town boards which doesn't sound like that's going to happen but you have the historical society prominent individuals in your town um, if you can get their nice. letters of support get them in writing and like um, and like Rebecca was saying Gather the history. Um, well, that's we what we're have, working on now. Working yeah. On. yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we we went know. to the, go ahead. What were you saying, George? Well, I, I don't know how much help this, we're trying to get this Facebook uh, page. We've got it very well initiated, probably two thirds done, but we haven't quite totally finished it. We were hoping that would get some interest out there. Right. Um, and we also <laughs> would um, advertise, if you will, in the local papers that that, that uh, space exists or we're, and we're trying to solicit information about the school. And um, we, there is, you know, we still have a good shot of getting some things, but we don't have enough of and don't have any of pictures of what the building looked like, you know, the interior. Those interior, kinds of yeah. Yeah, and uh, like Stephen has recollections and other people have right. that went there. We can, we can solicit a lot of those and stories from those things. Yeah. And, and that's vital. That's absolutely positively vital. And and media, yeah. contact you know your local newspaper. Tell them the story. We had um, the Concord Monitor a couple of years ago. They've done two articles on us. The first one was fabulous, and it actually ended up um, going nationwide to U.S. World and News. However, it happened. I don't know. Yeah. But grab your closest. What town do you live in? I'm sorry. Atkinson. Atkinson. We're right over the border from Haverhill, Massachusetts. Okay. And we're a town that was 500 people as late 5, as 000. 1949, and now okay. 500. 500. Now we're what? What's our population? At least close to six 7, or seven thousand. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's what everywhere. you got to do is get get your story out. Get your Facebook yeah. done. Ours. We just, we posted every single week and sometimes a couple of times a week. We well, also we... went into the town hall in the vault of the town hall. Yeah. They had, they have the history going way back, right to the beginning. And we, we, we were lucky enough to have the, um, the manager there copy all this history for us so that we could cut and paste and put all of this history in. But right. get people. Fire it up. Get letters of support. That's, I mean, yeah. you've, don't you have somebody that's really important in town that a prominent <laughs> individual or more than one? We, we have one, we tried. Um, <laughs> yeah. She's yeah. Her, 
the the gentleman that went to, one of the gentlemen that went to the school passed away a few years back but he was a big builder in the town and he right. big name and his daughter runs that business now i mean it's a multi-million dollar business right and we so, went out uh, to talk to her and we kind of uh, told her what our plans were and she kept saying well i don't want to get into this with the with our selectmen because they're you know they're constantly trying to get contracts and uh, land disputes taken care of and things like that so they didn't want to aggravate an already <laughs> aggravated group of selectmen you must see well, one, one of our Monday night selectmen one meetings. little bit of advice that works in every town where the board of selectmen is think yeah. about what will make them look good okay and because they want to look good so yeah, and they don't want, i think right? what i'm hearing that's missing here is a vision for what that building can become that people can get excited about. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, no. And, uh, and I bet yeah, that's what really, Becky was going to say. Yeah. yeah and one, to us also. one asset, um, maybe talk to um, somebody who's teaching history in your school. Um, I think there's there's some component somewhere in the elementary school where they do have some New Hampshire history. Right. Um, yeah. And you say it's near the school. Um, the other thing is, yes, do, you know, work with whatever press you have, but don't get too hung up on the Facebook page. Atkinson may have um, some community Facebook pages, like there's uh -huh. there are several in Stratum, like there's one called Stratum Talks, or you know right. you're from Stratum yeah. Quinn. Yeah, we have one. And you can put stuff there. And the other thing that, that we just really early on when we were trying to breathe some life into the Heritage Commission is we would just show up anywhere with the card table. You know, this is who we are. This is what we're trying to do. In your case, you know, flyers with whatever uh, history um, you have of the school, just say you're getting started and um, have a thing where people can sign up to say, you know, you, you're interested in saving the school. You just sort of have to start showing up physically at, at events, um, you know, say the lead up to town meeting or in the hallway outside town meeting or if, you know, things just. And I don't think you want to make the selectmen angry with you. No, you See, don't. I want think to. it's worth it to go to get, get on their agenda and yeah. go to them and say, there is a group of us who would really like to try to save this building and have yeah. it become whatever. Would you be willing to give us two years to accomplish that? Because we feel that this will benefit the town in X, Y, and Z ways. So again, it's going to make them look good. If they can give you a chance to succeed, they can take some of that credit. Yes. We have already done that twice. Yeah. <laughs> and the first time we asked for a year and their response was, we think you can come up with something in less than a year. Something some, by some, way of what? Some, some plan or whatever. Um, and then we came back to them a second time, but it's really been mostly like um, not enthusiastic, but not necessarily ready to shut it down kind of thing it's it's kind of strange we went in front of the planning board as well yeah and the we, planning board we, know we need to do that at some point the planning board was receptive but um as everybody's saying and they kept asking us with with our church <laughs> yeah it's it's on the federal register okay yeah, yeah, um how many one second do we have 15 or 20. Okay. Well, that's maybe 20 is exaggerating. And people are saying, well, do you have services? Yeah, we have four during the summer. We have Christmas. Well, what are you going to use this for? Yeah. And you Same. can't just depend on it being a church. So we had to try to come up with some innovative yeah. ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it can be a meeting house. I mean, with the school, <clears throat> Sue is a retired school teacher or educator. I don't know what she wants to be called. Yeah. But <laughs> um, what we want to do, <clears throat> and with the schoolhouse, we were telling the town and anybody who would listen that we um, 
we want to have classes there, like a day in the life of to mirror right. Canterbury. Canterbury has a fabulous program. Right. Yeah. And um, I don't remember who said it. it was either Maggie or Rebecca. The fourth grade does right. the history of New Hampshire. And the good news yeah. is the Kelly Corner Schoolhouse and the church has been on a tour. The president of the historical society in June gets a school bus, brings the fourth grade class. Yep. And we they tour all of these things. Yes. Yeah. So that has generated uh, an, an intense amount of interest. But have something lined up. What can we do? Right. We, well, you know, think of something you can do with this other than just have the building sit there. Right. I'd right. like to... I, I'd like to thank you for your advice to Atkinson, but I'm also looking at the clock. We only have about yeah. 10 minutes left. And I, I want to make sure we get to the other people who are here to share right. a little bit about their projects and challenges as well. So thank yeah. you, Ellen and George and Stephen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, would you like to speak about your project? Okay. I'm David Colglazier, and I'm the uh, treasurer for the Londonderry Historical Society. Uh, I'm also on the Heritage Commission. Uh, we have a house that belonged to the Perry family who donated it. It's a central chimney, two-story, dates from about 1725, possibly earlier. It was on a piece of land that uh, the owner wanted to sell, so he donated the house to us. He actually donated it to the town, and then the town has told us to uh, take care of it. And we did get some money originally to have it taken down. We have it moved. We have a couple of trailer bodies with parts in it. We also have other parts that are stored in a barn uh, on a property. Uh, so the Historical Society has a house already. We have a barn and we have a blacksmith shop. Uh, so we wanted to move this in. And we also have, with the money that were given to us, we have a foundation set up for the house. And we have the first floor uh, framing, uh, and then it's been capped. Uh, the people who got the project started uh, are both uh, deceased. Uh, they both died separately, but very early in their mid-60s. And they were, they were good at getting things rolling and moving. So they were uh, spearheading this a lot. But with them no longer around, why things have sort of slowed down quite a bit. Uh, we have a good documentation of the house before and during it's uh, being taken down. So I've, there's about 600 photographs of it in different phases of being taken down. Uh, we have been doing some additional uh, research on the people who lived there and we've got some bad information from the donor uh, about a person who lived there who doesn't seem to be, who actually lived elsewhere, but he was a notable local person. Uh, so we're back to just calling it by the house, by the name of the people who gave it. We've had a, a firm come in, a preservation timber frame, They've looked at, uh, looked and drawn up all the pieces we have. We've got some cost ideas about it. Uh, we don't, when we have some research also done about the age of the different frame parts. Uh, and then, um, well, so we're mostly lacking uh, uh, money, community involved, community support, let's say. But we're trying to work on that. And just because of COVID, we haven't been able to get much community involvement because we haven't been able to do much. Last summer, we were able to have some additional outdoor programs by the uh, uh, New Hampshire Symphony, 
So we've been trying to bring, bring people into the site and also uh, have them involved in some other programs, but we just haven't, haven't been able to do a lot of programming. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the idea that the, the building itself would be a very good office for the historical society. Mm -hmm. And also it would have, have some uh, spaces in it that could be used for small meetings. And so we have a plan, a floor plan to uh, utilize the way it was set up originally, but also add additional space within the confines of the original structure. Because it was built over a period of years and is built in probably three to four stages. And so we've been okay. able to document that as we had it taken down by first period colonial. Well, I think it's first period colonial. Yep, Bob, uh, Bob Pothier. Pothier. Yeah. yeah, he did so, a very good job of, of that. And I was there with him for a lot of it. Uh, I think everybody's uh, facing COVID related challenges right now, David. Um, yes, I yes. wonder if other people have advice as to how to launch a fundraising program, get people into your project to see it, to understand what you're trying to do when there's so much worry and fear about spreading disease. Anybody else share that? Well, somehow. <laughs> Wait. Wait I was just gonna say later. some, go ahead, David. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you have to be persistent. One of the things we did was we went to the town hall, we bought the list of taxpayers. So we had everybody's name and addresses and we went through and we highlighted the ones that we thought were really, really gonna be generous. And we sent out <laughs> letters to everyone. And like I said, media and so forth. But David, we were able to raise over $100,000 during COVID from December, 2019 to this past spring and everything was media, um, but like we said before, you know, newspaper articles, Facebook, we did our own Facebook page, but we also did the local <clears throat> Facebook pages. Um, we had the, um, the thermometers out there. You gotta be in their face. You had the and seven to save sign on your building too. Yes, the yeah. seven to save. <laughs> So and, when you see something yeah. happening at a building, mm -hmm. it immediately draws your attention. You know what it's like when you drive through your town and as Becky did, see a for sale sign in front of a historic building. Boy, you slam on the brakes and think, oh my God, what's happening? Yep, you so do. People wanna know what's happening. And if there are visible signs, even if they can't actually gather, but that you are somehow communicating, that will start the buzz. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to um, switch now to Anne because uh, Anne and whoever the other person is, are you on the okay. same project? So, hi, no, I'm Anne Killian. Um, um, maybe you can see what mine is. Does that come across? It's a one and a half story cape and it's in Jackson, New Hampshire. Um, it I'm on the board of the land trust, uh, Upper Saco Valley Land Trust. And originally, and it's part of um, about a thousand acres of land. And the challenge is with the land trust, typically natural resources are what we're used to and what we typically manage. And with this land came this 200 year old one and a half story cape that is in pretty good shape, but has been abandoned for about 60 years wow. um, and needs a bit of work as well. But um, so we managed to change the contract. We're, we're in the process of purchasing this land and the contract required demolition of the house. So we were able to work with the seller and I got support from the board and the land trust to save the house from demolition. Um, we probably won't own the house till June and I'm just looking for help to be proactive to begin what we need to, to save the house. It's unlike the case studies you presented tonight in that it's just a simple, um, very rural off the grid in the sense it was built without electricity and it happens that it's within a section of the road that doesn't have power, it's not an option. 
unless we move the house and it's that's not our first priority we it, it, it's a I think the value, um, other than obvious, uh, it's a historic resource, is that it, it represents a snapshot in time when um, farming and remote uh, an area, uh, it, it, it's a visible uh, example of what it was like in the early 1800s. So mm -hmm. there isn't um, huge community support yet, but again, it isn't known. I like that thermometer idea. I thought of the seven to save. Is seven to save something that's an option for um, nonprofit? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Actually, so um, we're just at six o'clock. So I'm just oh. going to see if we can get some information from Younger. Is that how you say it? Younger with a Y or Younger with a J? Um, but if you could, uh, for David and Anne and, and Younger, if you want to send me an email to NF Preservation. Uh, nhpreservation.org, um, just a little background on your projects and I can hopefully steer you to some good resources and maybe find a mentor to help you with your project. But Younger, do you want to tell us briefly about yours? It's, it's Judy Younger. Oh, Judy uh, Younger, Ring okay. I'm in Ringe, New Hampshire, and I'm, okay. I work with the um, Ingalls Memorial Library um, the, the uh, 1894 group. Um, the one thing we have at our library, and I don't know whether this would even fit under this category, but on the third floor of our library, which we can't access because very steep steps and no handicap accessibility, but there's a wonderful collection of almost every bird, every animal from our town and um, it, it was a um, project by uh, Mary Lee Ware um, from the Ringe community. And she donated it to the library and it's up in the attic. Um, and I don't know whether this, is this something that would fall under this category? Um, it's a community resource. Um. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are other libraries that do have somewhat inaccessible third floors that they're trying to figure out solutions because the, the space is good for using for people, but the access to it is not the greatest. Um, so we can definitely talk about um, uh, different possible solutions, or even if you hold the, the collection there and you bring out pieces of it and see if you can do a pop-up museum somewhere or a video collection or some other, there are ways to help um, present those resources to the community. Uh, so we can definitely brainstorm some ideas for you. Um, uh, yeah, I'd love to help too. Collections are not a part of what we do. Um, okay. But building renovation acts or accessibility definitely would be. Right. I, I was on the board of a small natural history museum in the town where I live. And they now call themselves the last and only natural history museum in the state. Um, so collections like yours are becoming increasingly rare. And if they do exist, there are problems with accessibility. So yeah, I think I'd love to be part of a phone call to explore okay. uh, further what you're trying to do. And okay. maybe Thanks. Nicole who lives in your part of the state could come look at the building. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this is the first in, um, like I said, a series of three uh, getting started programs. The next one is going to be on Thursday, January 13th at 12 o'clock noon. And that one will be focusing on kind of creating a plan for the project. So um, basically starting to build that framework and find your support and identify the resources that you have and also to kind of have a vision of where you're going because it's really hard to get people involved and to get the money, monetary support that you need for a project if you can't tell them, this is what we're doing, this is where we're going. So um, I encourage you to sign up for that. It should be up on our website soon. I'll be sending out a follow-up email from this program. And also I'll be contacting each of you to just uh, talk through some of your challenges that you've got and see what kind of resources and assistance the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance can give you. Um, 
So I want to thank our panelists and thank my colleague uh, Maggie for your attendance and support and, and expertise tonight. And also thank you all for coming and sharing your projects with us. Definitely, I will be in touch with each of you um, to help uh, try and figure out what those next steps are. So thank you, everyone. And um, I hope you have a good evening. And if you have any questions or comments, you can always email me nf at nhpreservation.org. All right. Thank Thanks, you very Nicole. much.